Yıldız'ın bu bölümünde okul. birinci oturumun konuşmacılarını sahneye davet ediyorum. Oturum Başkanı Profesör Doktor Sayın Yaşar Tonto Hacettepe Üniversitesi. 'Yıkım girişiminin 10 yılı araştırma bulgularına açık erişim sağlama hedefine yaklaştık mı? Dr. Alma Swan, Spark Europe, İngiltere. Avrupa Bilimsel Yayımcılık ve Akademik Kaynaklar Koalisyonu. Etkin arışım, etkin açık erişim politikaları nasıl hazırlanır ve uygulanır başlıklı konuşmasıyla Eloy Rodriguez, Minho Üniversitesi Portekiz. Efendim hepiniz hoş geldiniz. Ee... Bu oturumda açık erişimle e, uzun yıllardır ilgilenen iki seçkin konuşmacımız var. Sağ yanımda Sayın Doktor Alma Sıvan, sol yanımda da Sayın Eloy Rodriguez. İzninizle ben kendileri hakkında kısaca bilgi vereceğim sonuçlarını yapmadan önce. E, Sayın Sıvan... Spark Avrupa Müdürü, Spark biliyorsunuz Bilimsel İletişim ve Akademik Kaynaklar Birliği Koalisyonu, aynı zamanda Enabling Open Scholarship Organizatörü, bir araştırmacı danışman. Bilimsel iletişim alanında çalışıyor uzun yıllardır. Artık kendi Key Perspectives adlı bir şirketi de var bu o alanda ünlü. Dünyadaki üniversite yöneticilerinin bir e, örgütü olan Enabling Open Scholarship'te de aynı zamanda son derece e, önemli bir e, pozisyonda. Director of Open Access Journals ile aşinasınızdır. Onun aynı zamanda e, yöneticilerinden biri. Ve değişik zamanlarda gerek e, açık erişimin altyapısı gerekse e, özellikle e, UNESCO, Birleşmiş Milletler gibi kurumların açık erişim politikalarının geliştirilmesinde çok önemli rol oynamış bir konuşmacı kendisi. Akademik olarak Southampton Üniversitesi'nden lisans ve doktora dereceleri almış ya da kalfa ve üstad dereceleri de diyebiliriz buna. Warwick Üniversitesi'nden işletme yüksek lisansı var. 96'da e, demin sözünü ettiğimiz e, şirketi kurduktan sonra da uluslararası alanda danışmanlığını sürdürüyor. Bugün e, Sayın Doktor Alma Sıvan bize e, açık erişimin ilk 10 yılı konusunda geldiğimiz noktayı ve araştırma bulgularına erişimle ilgili e, e, gelinen e, noktayı özetleyecek. Ben... E, Kendisinin e, konuşmasını çok uzun tutmayacağını düşünüyorum ama e, ikiye kadar zamanımız olduğuna göre sanıyorum ki yarım saatlik bir süre e, konuşabilecek. Soruları gerek Sayın Alma Sıvan gerekse Eloy Rodriguez e, sunuşlarını bitirdikten sonra alacağız. E, böylece belki süreye de e, e, uymuş oluruz. E, buyurun Sayın Doktor Sıvan. Good morning. That was very long and I don't know what he said. I hope it was. I hope it was good. I heard my name a few times. <laughs> um, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, and um, I thank the organisers for inviting me to speak this morning. I'm going to give an introductory talk about open access to try to set the context of where we've come from, what's been happening, and what we're looking forward to. And having set that context, then Eloy, my colleague, will talk about policy developments in open access. So he will focus in on that specific topic. 20 years ago, um, something called, <coughs> which came to be called, the subversive proposal was made. Now, let me take you back a little more than 20 years to start with. And that was in 1991, when this thing called archive was started. Archive was, <coughs> is an open access collection, a database in high energy physics. And it has been going now for 23 years. It's still flourishing, in fact, better than ever. It has, has uh, many, many, many papers in it and thousands added every week. So that was the scene for the subversive proposal, which was made in June of 1994. 
And the subversive proposal was made by Stephen Harnad, who was at the time at Southampton University. And it simply said that now that we have an internet, authors in other disciplines can copy the high energy physicists and make their work available for sharing with each other by posting their work onto FTP sites. Those of you who are old enough will remember what FTP sites were. And this, the purpose of this was to free up the literature and give free access to their peers. That was the proposal at the time, 20 years ago this year. So what happened next? Well, what happened next, of course, was that the World Wide Web appeared very shortly afterwards for us all to use, and it has changed just about everything in our lives. I just want to share with you this paper, or a glimpse of this paper. This was Tim Berners-Lee's first draft of the paper that described the World Wide Web as he conceived it. It was back in 1989, and um, it was a full paper, and as you can see, there's a lot of drawings and diagrams and things. But, so it's a historic document. The important thing about this document, other than its historical importance, is the little bit of scribble in handwriting on the top right-hand corner. And I'm going to give you a close-up of that. This is what his supervisor wrote after he read that paper. Vague but exciting. I think that's probably one of the great understatements of the 20th century. So where have we got to? 20 years have gone past. We've had the web for 20 years. We've had the subversive proposal. It was a good idea. We all agree with that. Where are we? Well, this is where we are. This graph shows the levels of open access in different disciplines and fields of research now, or in fact, a year ago when this was done. We haven't yet reached 100%. In fact, we haven't reached 50%. And in some disciplines, we are much, much lower than that. So most of the scholarly literature, even after 20 years of it being possible to be free, is not free. It's still locked up in subscription-based journals that most people cannot afford to buy. So the progress has been partial but not great. And this line shows the temporal progress. So this shows the years up to 2010 in those different disciplines. And as you can see, there's not a great deal of increase in any of them. Things have changed a bit since 2010. So here in 2014, we will have seen most of those lines go up a little bit. And that work, the repeat of this, is just being done right now for a European project called Pasteur, which I may remember to mention later on. So what happened next? The answer was not a lot. Some, but it could have been much better over 20 years. So what were the problems? Why hasn't this progressed as we might have hoped? Let's just talk about the authors to start with, because they are the ones who could, if they wished, and if they understood properly, have made this happen long ago, like the high energy physicists. So why haven't they? First of all, there's been a great lack of awareness amongst authors about what open access is and the reasons for it. There's been a lack of understanding about how to make their work open access and what benefits it might bring. There's been a great overdose of misunderstanding. So these are where people get it wrong and therefore turn their mind against it because they think it's something that it's not. And it's up to all of us to work very hard to um, rectify those misunderstandings. There's been a definite fear of repercussions back on themselves for making their work open access. They fear that the publishers might punish them in some way, or they feel that it might be bad for their careers. Uh, actually, both of those are largely untrue, but it, 
but the authors still seem to feel that. <clears throat> and of course, we all know that in academia, our reward systems at the moment are not geared towards adoption of new models. They reinforce the traditional models of behavior when it comes to publishing research. And finally, I have to say that although every other aspect of our lives has changed because of the web, academic academic life in terms of dissemination of ideas and results has not changed very much at all. It's been a very, very, very slow adoption, probably the slowest of all. We all access and listen to music in different ways. We access and, and read news in different ways. We bank in different ways. We buy things in different ways. But when it comes down to sharing the findings of research, still doing things the same way as we did 300 years ago. With respect to the publishers, and I don't mean all publishers because some of them are very um, progressive in this, but the big traditional publishers have largely been a hindrance to open access. They have obstructed it wherever they have a chance. They have spread misinformation and uh, sometimes downright untruths about open access to frighten authors and policy makers away. So for advocates like myself and many of you in the audience, you know that we have had a very difficult time countering pub all this from the publishers as well as making p the positive case for open access to the authors and the policy makers. With respect to the libraries, and, and many of you here come from the library community, you know that in many cases you have been hooked into big deals, which has meant that your library budgets have not only been frozen, probably, um, or at least not going up very much, but that a proportion of those budgets are allocated to paying for journals in bulk from big publishers, and that rather um, dampens the chance for innovative thinking, innovative action in the library. There's also been the problem that policy has not been made in libraries, largely. Libraries implement policy, but they don't make it. And although they can, within institutions, often influence the policy making quite well, and Eloy will be telling us about that in his own institution, in some cases, policy is made without consultation with libraries, and certainly in the case of national policies, this has largely been the case. There, within libraries, I do have to say, there have been varying levels of buy-in or acceptance of the notion of open access. So while we have many committed and active librarians working for open access, we also have many who are not persuaded by the argument or they have other priorities and are not helping to advance it. And in some cases there are, even when they are trying to help, there is some level of preoccupation with issues that really are not relevant and largely to do with copyright. And we can talk about how copyright doesn't matter when Eloy gives his talk later. And finally, the policy makers. Now, there are some policy makers in this room, the institutional managers, university rectors, and so forth, and national funders, so the Higher Education Council, certainly a policy, potential policy maker. They started off slow to act. It's taken a lot, a lot of the 20 years to get open access on policy makers' agendas. In cases where they have understood the issue and want to do something about it, they have often lacked courage to be really bold with their policy. And we will be learning about how to make a good policy from Eloy in the next talk. There has been, when there is a policy, a kind of complacency about that. I've made the policy, that's it. Now stop talking to me about it and go away. The policy is there. They haven't monitored it. They haven't seen whether it's been successful. They haven't taken an interest in its implementation. And they have not tried to enforce that policy in many cases, which has resulted in a policy being there, but no open access as a result. 
all of this is changing now, I am happy to say. So we are on, um, an, a, what should I say, a downward curve, really. We are off down the hill now. We've got the wind behind us, and we are not climbing anymore. Things are changing, and policymakers are, are now on the go. So where are the areas of promise, then, for the future for open access? First of all, we, I think, um, being part of the advocacy community, this sounds a little bit boastful, but I think we are getting better at advocacy. We are, for example, able to collect data and put over the arguments for the benefits of open access. So the, the higher visibility, the usage, and the impact of research. That's one huge benefit, and, and it speaks very well to authors, institutions, and funders. The fact that all of a sudden, by opening up research, we can enjoy much higher usage and much higher impact. Us as authors, universities as aggregates of authors, and funders as people who have to disperse public money and want to see a good impact for doing that. This is just a little piece of evidence because I don't like to say things, many things without evidence. This is a graph showing the kind of usage that articles are getting from the research repository, the open access repository at the University of Liège in Belgium, which is at the moment the most successful policy in the, on the planet. And you can see the numbers there. These are individual articles down the side here. And these are the numbers of times that they have been downloaded from that repository in a month. They're very large numbers. And what I want you to remember here is that this is new and additional usage of this work. The people, the relative few people who work in institutions, whose libraries can afford to buy the journals, don't show up here. They're reading the work in the journals. This is where open access is making it possible for that work to reach out to the rest of the world, for those of us who are in institutions who cannot afford those particular journals. So this is new and additional usage, and much of that usage translates into citations, of course, so the author gets impact as a result of opening their work up. And here is a little bit of data to show that kind of citation impact. This bar chart shows the percentage increase in citations enjoyed by articles that are made open access compared, by, compared to articles in the same issue of the same journal that are not made open access. So you're comparing like with like, and you're saying, if one's made open access, how many citations does it get? And if another very similar article is kept closed in the journal, open only to those who can buy the journal, what number of citations can that get? And let's do the sums over millions of articles, and this is the result. So in every field, there is an increase, the percentage increase does differ from field to field, but that simply reflects citation patterns, the, the behavior of citing in different fields of, of research endeavor. So we've made that answer. Um, we've persuaded people that research becomes more efficient. It can proceed faster, of course, because you don't have to spend time trying to look for, discover, uh, access the uh, literature because it's freely available. So the research process as a result becomes much better. Duplication is minimized because people can see what has been done more easily. There is much less going into cul-de-sacs because somebody's gone there before and has flagged that up in an open access paper and so forth. And of course open access fits with the new way of doing research, which is practiced by our, I sh suppose I should nearly be calling them the millennium generation. Certainly we'll call them the net generation. The people who have never known a world where there is no World Wide Web. And they are 
practicing research which is all conducted digitally and it is natural for them to want to share what they're doing with one another. That's how they live the rest of their lives as we know. We've also made the case for benefits to institutions, so to universities and research institutes. These are the kinds of benefits that they enjoy from open access. It fits with their mission to educate, to create knowledge, and to spread that knowledge far and wide. They enjoy the aggregated visibility usage and impact that their authors enjoy, but it also gives them a repository full of open access material, gives them a new tool for monitoring what's going on in the institution, in the research program, which they have been unable to do very well before now, to understand what's being published from that institution, <clears throat> to look at competitive intelligence, look at what other institutions are doing, and do a bit of comparative stuff, um, and to reach out beyond academia into the commercial and industrial world where the basic knowledge that is created in academia is then used and developed in research and development to create <coughs> society, a benefits for society and a wealth-based economy. And finally, this last point here, just to the rectors I'm speaking now. The Queensland University of Technology in Australia has had the se second longest mandatory policy on open access. It was it, it implemented in 2004, so we've had 10 years of that now. A few years ago, the deputy vice chancellor who was responsible for that policy and had taken a personal interest in championing it since he implemented it, did a little study to find out what the effect of it was. And actually, I was involved in helping with that, so we did some of the research with them. What we found was that as well as getting a lot of testimonies from the authors in that institution, saying things like, I've made my work open access in our repository, and as a result, I have new collaborations, I have had lots of interest in my work, I've seen my citations go up, all those sorts of things. We also had some saying, somebody, an industrial company noticed my work and has asked me to work with them. And, they ha and so I've brought funding into the university. And when we looked at the funding pattern for that university against the rest of the Australian universities, it's not a big one, that one, but it is a technical university. When we looked at the funding pattern over five to six years, we found that it had, it had one in more than double the amount of industrial funding than the average of the rest of the Australian university. And we tied those things together because we were getting these testimonies and it looks like making work freely available so that companies can search the web and find out where the kind of basic research is being done that they need for their innovation. By doing that, they are forging links and collaborations with industrial companies. Um, and to funders. Uh, so the benefits to funders are also that you have a monitoring tool to look at the results of what you're funding and also, you have something for maximizing return on your investment. So here's a table. I've just put this in because I thought that afterwards, if you wanted to take the slides, this might be useful to you. And I've just indicated where these benefits apply to those three different constituencies. <clears throat> on, on the policy level, I'm not going to say too much about this because it's Eloy's topic. But we are, have progressed a lot. We now have over 200 institutional policies, nearly 50 sub-institutional, i.e. faculty or school level policies, 90 funder policies, many of those national ones, which is excellent. Um, and in Europe, 
we have the new Horizon 2020 rules, and there is an open access policy within those. It's mandatory, unlike the um, pilot one that was operating in the previous framework program that has just finished. And the Commission made a recommendation to member states in 2012 that they should all make a policy and that it should align with that Horizon 2021. It should look like that so that the authors are not confused by having two different kinds of policies to comply with. And of course, we've seen quite a big thing happening in the US. There's many other things, but I just wanted to highlight those two things. The Office of Science and Technology Policy in the White House issued a directive early this year to the big federal agencies in the US saying that they must ensure that the work, the, the results that they create, the knowledge that they create from their federally funded programs must be made openly available for sharing. So that's the current picture on policy, open access policy. You can see it's been growing. Um, the red is the funder policies, the blue, the institutional ones, and the green, the school or faculty level ones. So growing, but we need it to grow more. And uh, I hope that those policymakers who are here today might go away and think about adding their number to that uh, quite soon. Another area where there's been some um, progress and now lots of promise is in infrastructure. Of course, we have moved in the digital age from print to electronic, thank goodness. We've had hyperlinking since the beginning of the web, and that's working brilliantly within the scholarly literature, except that we can't see most of the scholarly literature. We have embarked upon a program of linked open data. I put the question mark there because people are still arguing as to whether this is progressing or not, but at least we're trying. Um, and then there is a lot of work going on on interoperability within the infrastructure that is supporting open access. So we're talking here about the network of repositories within universities and research institutes, and in some cases, funders who have their own repositories. How to make it easy to deposit the work. What we do about identifying the authors uniquely when many of them may have the same name. What we do about licensing that material so that it truly is free to share and reuse. How do we preserve it? Preservation of the scholarly literature used to be the domain of libraries in universities who bought journals and put them in their basement. They bound them, put them in the basement. There for all time. What do we do now? Are we expecting libraries to preserve electronic files for all time? They don't even own them in most cases if they're, bought, if they're leased from the publishers. So there's work in progress on that and so forth. I want to just highlight a success story as I see it, which is within the European Union where quite a lot of money has been put in over the last few years by the Commission to establish the infrastructure which is going to support its new policy. So what we have is this. We have authors in one place and readers also in a place, and often, of course, they are the same people. And what we want to do is get the information from the authors to the readers without any barriers. And the easiest way of doing that is to ask the authors, or in fact tell them in the policy, to put their work in their institutional repository make it open access. And then the readers can find that through Google or other web search engines. Now the EU has put in place another extra little bit in this jigsaw. It's called Open Air, Open Access Infrastructure for Research in Europe. And it is like a big repository. It harvests from all the institutional repositories in the EU so all the universities who have a repository collecting material, it harvests the metadata, the descriptive data, not the full text of the articles, they remain where they were put in the first place, but it harvests the metadata and it beams it out to the world. So it's a showcase for European research. If you want to see European funded research, here, search this. That's the raison d'etre for open air. 
So the readers have an easy way to go if they know they want to see what's going on and what's being, um, what's being created by European-funded projects. That's a very nice piece of infrastructure, and actually that pattern has been copied on a national level in many countries now, and others are adopting it. Um, open data, very big interest in open research data, as if we haven't got enough to do with open access to articles, there is now the challenge of open data and how we're going to get that on the agenda. But it is on the agenda of many funders. No universities at the moment, but funders are taking a big interest in this. And many of them are developing policy on open data, including the European Commission. And only three days ago, the Norwegian Funding Council announced its new open data policy. So they're starting to come in quite regularly now. There's lots of infrastructure there already, and as I t talk, you'll see some examples. There are many, many more examples than this of homes for open data, as well as the repositories within universities. Universities can do so much, and if the rectors are worrying about the potential cost here of looking after data as well as papers, um, you don't need to, because when we're talking about big data sets generated by astronomers and physicists and biomedical people, there are homes elsewhere for those big data sets. It's just the little ones that you need to think about. And finally, the issues and challenges that are ahead of us. The humanities. Everything's been focused on the sciences so far. The humanities have always been, oh yes, and the humanities will come to those later. But things are happening in the humanities. We're seeing university presses waking up to open access and adopting it as a model for their publications, which is very encouraging. They're doing this because it fulfills their mission, their original mission, to spread the knowledge that was created in that university. So they've found a way of doing it, and they are doing it. With open data, we're finding ways of looking after and preserving um, the material for all time, as I showed you in some of those things. And there's a lot of interest in developing data management practices, and many funders are requ uh, requiring data management plans to be included in grant applications. So that's a good step forward there. There's quite a lot of um, challenge around licensing open access material and whether the licenses applied will make it truly open or not. This has implications for the new computational technologies. Um, and so there's a lot of discussion going on around that at the moment, with, I might say, some obstruction from the publishers. And finally, there's sustaining that new system. A lot of services have been developed, like repositories, but others too, that are supporting the, the move to open access. Most of those started as projects and have continued to run on project, recurrent project funding, but that is no way to sustain a scholarly communication system forever. So we're starting to see some thinking around how to change that, how to make our most critical open access services sustainable for the future. And that is where funders and institutions have to take a long, hard look at what is going on. So I'm talking about funders, really, and libraries. A long, hard look at what is going on and start to talk about what your role is going to be in looking after that new system. The money to have an open access scholarly communication system is already there. It's being spent on journals at the moment. What we need to do, all of us, putting our heads together, is to work out how we have changed that around so that we can spend the money on the new system and make it there in a sustainable way. We don't actually need all the money that we currently spend, because a lot of that goes off in profits to the publishers. And we could save that if we found a way for the academic community to do this better within itself. 
This is my final slide. It's 220 something years old. This is the first president of Johns Hopkins University, Daniel Coit Gilman. He said, it's one of the noblest duties of a university to advance knowledge and to spread it. Not only within the institution, but outside to the general population. In other words, create knowledge for the benefit of society. I think this was the first statement in favor of open access, and it's no less true today than it was 220 years ago. So I often finish my talks with this, and I think we could do far worse than bear this in mind as we go forward. So thank you very much. Teşekkürler Sayın Doktor Sıvan. Şimdi e, sırada e, Bay Eloy Rodriguez var. Eloy Rodriguez, Portekiz'deki Minyo Üniversitesi'nin e, Dokümantasyon Hizmetleri Müdürü. E, kendisi 2003 yılında e, bu üniversitede ilk açık girişim politikası geliştirilmesi çalışmalarına başladı ve Eloy'un özellikle 2011'deki e, değişiklikten sonra e, geliştirdiği açık erişim politikası şu anda dünyadaki en başarılı açık erişim politikalarından biri. Kendisi aynı zamanda Portekiz'de ve Portekizce konuşulan ülkelerde e, dijital arşivler, kurumsal arşivlerin savunuculuğunu yapıyor. E, 2008'den bu yana da RICAP diye adlandırabileceğimiz Portekiz Açık Erişim Bilimsel Arşivinin teknik ekibinin yöneticiliğini yapıyor. Bunun yanı sıra Avrupa Üniversite Birliği'nde Portekiz Rektörler Kurulu'nu temsil eden Açık Erişim Çalışma Grubu üyeliğinde bulunmuş. COAR diyebildiğimiz Açık Erişim Arşivleri Konfederasyonu'nda Dijital Arşiv Birlikte çalışma, Çalışabilirlik Çalışma Grubu Başkanlığı yapmış. Bunun yanı sıra Avrupa Birliği destekli birçok projeler yürütmüş durumda. İloy'un bizim açımızdan diğer önemli Yanlarından bir tanesi de e, aramızda görüyorum. Bazı arkadaşlarımız bizzat Minyo Üniversitesi'nde staj yaptılar, eğitim gördüler e, açık erişimle ilgili olarak. E, bunun için de ayrıca kendilerine teşekkür ediyoruz. İloy. Thank you much, Yasser, and uh, thank you to all the Turkish colleagues for inviting me here for this uh, event. Um, as we are running late, I will not. Uh, uh, uh, spend too many uh, time on, on this point, but I, it was it is really a pleasure to be here and to to share with uh, with you uh, what I think it's a, a very important moment for for open access development uh, in Turkey. Uh, I will try to make a kind of a short presentation, not speaking uh, too too uh, too fast because of the automatic translation, and. Uh, I will start by by uh, uh, talking a little bit about uh, uh, what are the, the feature, the main characteristics characteristics of a good institutional university level uh, open access policy. Then I will talk uh, uh, also a little bit about uh, founder policies, and I will uh, briefly conclude, conclude with two main remarks that I think are really uh, important. So as uh, almost one already uh, settled the scene here, so my, my job is uh, uh, much easier now. But as you see, uh, there are lots of policies uh, around the world, especially on the, the last uh, uh, six or seven years, since 2008 and 2009. And uh, there are um, different types of policies. There are kind of voluntary policies where researchers are, are encouraged or requested to, to to uh, put their uh, publications in open access, and there are mandatory policies, as uh, almost one already already mentioned. And also on the mandatory policies, there are different kinds of mandatory policies. So there are uh, one of the most known is the, the kind of the Harvard-style uh, uh, open access policy, with, uh, with where the institution has a, a, a copyright retention policy. Uh, with uh, where, uh, but where authors can uh, uh, opt out on an individual basis for for each individual publication, and there is uh, other policies, uh, mainly in Europe, and uh, the best example is uh, uh, also also already mentioned by Alma, the Liège University, and now also Minu. We have a very similar policy, where uh, the, the the mandate is to self archive all the publications, regardless of the access status of the publication, and I will come back to it in a, in a minute. 
So uh, as there are many uh, different policies, I think it's very useful to, for us to take a, uh, a closer look to what kind of policies work better and are, are getting better results. So, uh, and that's what I'm, I'm talking uh, here uh, this morning. So, uh, the first uh, uh, very clear conclusion from, from the data that is available is that the, the most effective uh, policies are mandatory policies. Policies where, uh, uh, where uh, um, the, the, the authors are uh, mandated, are required to, to, to, uh, to, to uh, have their publications and to deposit their publications into a, a, a, a repository. And uh, there is already uh, lots of evidence. This is a graph from a book that we published uh, last year on our 10th anniversary of our repository from a, a, a chapter from Stephen Arnold that compares uh, the, the deposit rate of mandated and unmandated uh, uh, uh, universities, and uh, especially the two uh, uh, on the left. So this was done in 2013 for publications dated of 2012. So these are always kind of uh, provisional uh, uh, snapshots, because if we took the snapshot today, it will, be, it will look uh, different. It will probably look even better, even for Mino and for Liège. And but, and but you can clearly see that the, the mandated institutions have a much higher compliance rate than the, the other, the, the, the ones that don't have that mandate. The second uh, characteristic of the policy is that uh, the policy, uh, what the policy should require is immediate self-archiving. So what the policy should require is that at the time that uh, the researchers uh, receive the, the, the notification, and uh, I must just stress a little again another point that Tom already mentioned. Uh, open access uh, can, can, can and should be applied to all kind of uh, academic publications, to all kind of research publications that uh, authors produced without uh, intent of uh, re uh, receiving economic reward. But it, we are, uh, when we talk about open access, the, the, the main target, the main focus is the journal articles. So, and for those journal articles, when the author receives information from the publisher that uh, his article or her article was accepted for publication, that is the moment where uh, deposit should be required. And that's the moment why, uh, where should deposit should be required for several reasons. One, because it's the moment that we have a, a, a very concrete date. So it's, it was today that I received that, uh, that information that uh, the article uh, uh, is accepted to publication. Second, today I have uh, the copy of the article, the author copy, and in many cases, I will not go here into details, but uh, many publishers uh, will uh, allow you to self-archive uh, your, your, your article but the, the, so the, the peer review version of our article that is completely equal to the one that will be published on the journal, but it has not the journal formatting, the, the, the journal logo, etc. But th that's the copy. But that's the good, uh, uh, it's a, a good copy for open access because the content is already peer reviewed and the, exactly the same as the published version. And at that time, you have that copy. Uh, probably if you deposit, uh, if you just deposit three months after or six months after, and we know that uh, many times we don't, uh, we forgot that we deleted the file, we, uh, we don't know, and then we will have a problem to deposit the right version. So the right, uh, it's the right time to deposit the, the, the, the right version. And also, we can start promoting those advantages that almost one uh, uh, mentioned of, on visibility of the research result. Uh, the sooner you get your publication into repo the repository, the sooner it will be known. You are advertising it. You are giving a, a visibility and, imp and building a, uh, that the publication impact. So it's, uh, there are several reasons why a deposit at the moment of uh, acceptance of publication is the, the right uh, choice. And uh, 
And uh, we also, uh, there is uh, the, the, the graphs that I will show you now, uh, they are not uh, published yet. It's also uh, uh, uh, work from Stephen Arner that has submitted to, pub, to, to, to a journal, to Jesus. But uh, there is uh, sufficient evidence now that, uh, that uh, uh, policies that require deposit at the, uh, at the moment of publication acceptance get higher uh, deposit rates. So uh, that's what this graph uh, shows. Uh, a third important uh, feature of the policies is that uh, uh, uh, there should be no, no exception, no, no waiver for the deposit requirement. So every journal article, every publication must go into the repository. But uh, regarding the access, so and uh, the publication should be made open access uh, uh, as soon as possible, immediately, it, that's, that's the, the best option. Uh, if, if needed, with an embargo period, and uh, many journals will, uh, will require you to, to, to respect an embargo period from six months to 12 months, or, and some now even larger. Uh, but, but there are still some journals that, uh, uh, that uh, on there, when you sign your copyright transfer agreement, they, they, they will not uh, allow you to, to have your publication in open access. But even for those publications, even for those publications, uh, uh, you should require deposit on, on, on your repository and, and uh, giving them uh, uh, restricted access uh, uh, status. Because uh, then your repository can implement uh, the request a copy bu button that is available for, for the most common uh, repository software platforms like DSpace or ePrints where uh, when someone hits a, a closed access publication, he can directly request a copy to the, to the author, and the author can, re can reply to that requester in a uh, couple of, of, of clicks. So this is not uh, open access, but it's a kind of uh, uh, s close to, to, to open access. And by doing this, also, uh, especially as, as Alma said, m many uh, authors, many researchers are afraid of, uh, or they are unsure if they can deposit, if they can put it open access or in closed access, or what is the embargo period. So, especially at the beginning, when they, they, are, they have fears about this, making the possibility of accepting uh, uh, closed access or restricted access deposits will ease the, the, the, the the, the pain to researchers to deposit because they because otherwise they'll, uh, in many cases they will be paralyzed by the doubts of well what can I do with this with this uh, with this version and there is also evidence about this that uh, that the policies that have this kind of uh, mandate is also known as the immediate deposit optional access mandate so it's the Liège and Minho kind mandate. The, they also get much higher deposit rates than the, the, the, the policies that don't have this uh, feature. And finally, a very important point is to, to connect uh, uh, compliance with the policy, connect the uh, repository depos deposit with evaluation and reporting. So uh, uh, all, uh, if, if, uh, uh, and there is also, that's the model also from Liège and from Inu. If you, uh, all the publication lists, all the publications that, uh, that, that uh, are considered for evaluation and, and, and, and uh, reporting uh, inside the institution come from the, from the repository. If the publication is not in the repository, it's not considered for, for those purposes. And again, there is uh, evidence that uh, the policies that have those uh, uh, uh, um, uh, features uh, as have uh, higher uh, uh, deposit rates uh, have, uh, are more successful than the, the ones that don't have that. Uh, we are, there is already for the ones that uh, are uh, for, ex for institutional leaders that uh, think oh, I want to start to to do something, but uh, how can I do it? There is already a lot, lot of knowledge and documents about it. 
I will just mention briefly two, the MedOneNet guidelines for, uh, uh, for implementing open access policies. The MedOneNet project was a project where we also had a, a Turkish uh, uh, consortium member. It was uh, HTP University, and Yashar is very well uh, aware of this, of course. He was one of the main partners. And, uh, and uh, uh, on this, uh, on this project, we have provided guidelines with a model policy and also with the steps that should be followed to implement a policy, and these are here. And I put in bold something that also was already mentioned by Alma, is the question of follow-up and monitoring. It's not enough to, to define your policy and then sit still and doing nothing about it. You need to, to follow up and monitor what is happening. And uh, another example, and partially the Metronet guidelines were also inspired by, by this, it's the Portuguese Open Access uh, uh, Policy Kit uh, that we have uh, developed in 2009, 2010, and it's also available in English, uh, and you can, uh, uh, uh, there is the link, I think the, the slides will be available, so you can follow the link from there. I will just uh, very briefly uh, uh, talk and explain how, how this, uh, was implemented in, in Minho. So uh, we had our first policy in 2003. So uh, uh, we defined that uh, that uh, uh, the the publications, uh, as we wanted that the policy uh, that the, the the policy and the repository were were from the university. We did not uh, library mediated deposit. So it. Uh, it uh, it's the authors or people working directly with the authors that um, uh, uh, self-archive. And uh, uh, I will just go through this, this slide. Uh, the policy was established in 2004 uh, and following the, the signature of the Berlin Declaration. And it was implemented since the uh, beginning of 2005. Uh, it it uh, it was uh, the policy had attached a, a financial incentive on the first two years, and it uh, and the policy produced a lot of uh, a, a big result on the on the beginning. But afterwards, uh, because uh, both the financial incentive disappeared, and also because of uh, uh, also by internal reasons of of the university. We didn't. Uh, we could not continue to follow up and to monitor the policy. Uh, uh, the, the the deposit level has, has decreased. So in 2010, uh, the, the university and the new rector of the university decided to to to establish a new policy because we seen that the, the deposit rate decreasing since 2007, and because open access was and still is, if you go, to, if you uh, if you uh, read the, the uh, Min University uh, strategic plan, open access is on the strategic plan of the university. is one of the tools that university wants to use and is using to promote this uh, visibility, visibility and attracting both researchers and students. And, uh, and and we con we wanted to continue on on, on that uh, way, and at that time we also had uh, some evidence that there is an effect on the, the on the impact of the menu research uh, because we have uh, because of uh, our open access policy. So this is uh, the result of a study published in 2010 uh, that compares the the impact of uh, of uh, uh, papers that that were made open access. In repositories in Minho and and other and uh, other um, uh, institutions also with policies so QUT that also Alma already mentioned Southampton and uh, CERN and uh, and for for the four institutions including Minho there was an advantage of uh, of uh, of uh, of open access so papers deposit on repository in average at uh, uh, higher citation rates than papers that were not on on the repository. So since 2010, uh, uh, MINO uh, requires a mandatory deposit of all peer-reviewed publications into the re repository, and, and uh, uh, in all publication lists uh, or reports, uh, that should be a link to the repository. And, uh, and now we are currently developing a system of, uh, uh, res of uh, uh, researcher and teacher evaluation, and on that system, it will, it will be it will be uh, uh, uh, 
information system, so a, a, a computer application, and on that system, the only source of information on publications, it's it, it will be the repository. So it will, uh, there will be no one uh, able to report a, a publication by hand on that system, or it's on the repository and it will be uh, uh, counted, or it's not on the repository and it's not and it will not be accounted. So, and uh, in 2011, we, because we, we uh, uh, it's very important this, the, also this step, uh, we, we, uh, we go through the, the, the, all the old university explaining the policy, explaining the requirements, how to do it, etc. And we start monitoring, especially on the first uh, two years, the results of, uh, of that policy and the results were, were very clear. Uh, this is the, the, the average of the, the of the documents deposited in Mino in 2010 and and, uh, and in 2011, and you can of course I think you can figure out when we do when we did the monitoring because you, you, when we did the monitoring the the number of uh, of uh, publications rose. So on the last three years we we we get uh, uh, uh, open. Uh, deposit uh, compliance rate or around 70%. So the, the numbers of 2013, so these numbers were from beginning of 2014. So the numbers, uh, uh, we, we, I don't have uh, uh, updated numbers, but uh, they are, I think, uh, again, close to uh, on the around 70% for 2013. Because, the, uh, and that's something that we learned, because the policy has effect not only on the current year publications, but also on, on publications from uh, previous years. So for instance, even in 2013, uh, we had about uh, uh, f uh, more than 4,000 or 4,500 publications archived on, on our repository, and we have 2,000. Most about half of them were from the current year, but another half were from previous years. So uh, the second parts of my talk, and I'll, uh, this is, will be shorter because I'll, I, I will basically repeat what I already said. Even, even for funders, if they want to get a higher compliance rate, they, they must have very similar policies with the institution. So they should have a mandatory policy, a mandatory policy requiring immediate, immediate self-archiving for the reasons that I already explained and that they are exactly the same. Uh, Usually, founders they are in the position to to require open access. So usually, uh, uh, I think it's a good idea for institutional policy to to to uh, to have uh, to to have this uh, immediate deposit op optional access uh, uh, uh, framework. But for founders, they are because when you sign a, f a founding contract, you are. Your, your contract with the founding is previous to any other contract that you, you might sign with a publisher. So founders usually, they require to, that uh, they will not allow that the publication at the end uh, remain restricted access. But uh, in many cases, and most cases, they will allow to, to have that there is an embargo period, usually from six to 12 months. Uh, and another, uh, point for founder uh, uh, policies with an increasing number of open access journals and we, of open access journals that are charging article processing charges uh, f on, uh, on founder policies. Uh, it's also a, a good idea and it's very common that uh, the costs of article processing charges for open access journals uh, uh, are, are supported by, by the founding uh, rules of, uh, of that founder. And also, again, the same, the, the last point and very important point is that uh, uh, connect repository deposit with evaluation and reporting. That's something that we are also uh, working out uh, with the European Commission on the Open Air project to, to, to liaise directly. We already uh, liaise, so we, for instance, if you have an European project, you can already uh, uh, produce a, a reporting publication list from open air site, but uh, it's uh, uh, it's done by you as project manager or or, uh, or member of the project. But we want that to be uh, uh, built in on the on the reporting system of the commission. Uh, and uh, uh, we have already some good examples of this kind of policies that uh, I've just mentioned. So uh, the Horizon 2020 policy that uh, Alma mentioned. This is the, the, the, the clause with the details of, uh, of, of the policy. So it's a, 
uh, it's a mandatory policy, it's an immediate deposit policy requiring, requiring to, to, to self-archive, to, to deposit into a repository regardless of being uh, published on an open access journal or an, or an traditional uh, journal and also uh, and it's a policy that uh, allows an embargo period of 6 to 12 months. I will finish uh, with another example. It's a uh, work in progress now in Portugal. So in May 2014, this year, uh, the Portuguese uh, major founder, I think it's uh, the only really uh, uh, public founder in Portugal, the major one, uh, has defined an open access uh, policy uh, after uh, having a consultation process. And uh, the policy is, uh, is based, again, on, on self-archiving into a repository. And it was very important for us in Portugal that we have a very well-established repository network uh, and, uh, and that uh, is used for, for compliance. So what the policy states is that uh, all, all, all publications uh, uh, uh, with peer reviewing uh, should be deposited in, in at least one open access repository from the, the national uh, uh, repository infrastructure, uh, uh, preferably immediately upon uh, acceptance for publication. Uh, an embargo period is allowed and this policy applies not only to journal articles, but also to papers in conference proceedings, books and book chapters, monographs, masters and PhDs, etc., for all kinds of funding from uh, the, the, the, the Portuguese funding. And what we are now working at this, mo at this moment in Portugal is on the implementation because the first rounds are still being signed now, so we don't have yet publications, but uh, we are we have defined a standardized way to, to record funding information into the metadata. Uh, for evaluation pur purposes, also FCT will only consider publications that are on, on the repositories. Uh, it, it will not be possible to charge costs of publications that, were not, that are not deposited on the, on the repository infrastructure, and there will be a, a, a help desk system, uh, a mixed help desk system from the national founder and from the repository network to, to help uh, researchers to comply with the policy. So my two final slides and my two final points that I think are really important uh, is that uh, first we need to uh, it's very important that we define, define very simple and clear open access mandates. Uh, many times, at least in, I don't know what is the reality in, here in Turkey, but for instance in Portugal, as in other Latin or Southern uh, European countries, we, we like to use lots of words. But many times, less words is, is more, is better, is clear. So less rhetoric and plus detail and, and more concrete uh, requirements. And those concrete requirements were, were, uh, are the three that I already mentioned. So require deposit into repository at the time of acceptance of publication and connect uh, deposit with evaluation and reporting. And the final point also, I think very important, is that uh, if we want to have, uh, uh, uh, if we want to have any success, we need to, uh, to require just one thing. So, uh, researchers don't have to comply with three or four or five different sets of policies. They just need to do something once and it's, it's okay for the institution, it's okay for the national founder, it's okay for Horizon 2020. And again, the policy with, the, the, with the, those three, three characteristics that I mentioned, it's okay, for instance, for Horizon 2020. In the case of Portugal, it's okay with Horizon 2020, it's okay with the national founder, and it's okay, for instance, with the MINU open access policy. Thank you. Sayın Rodriguez'e teşekkür ediyoruz. Ben e, zamanımızı e, da göz önüne alarak e, değerli konuşmacıların e, e, sözleri üzerine herhangi bir şey söylemek istemiyorum. E, ama e, şunu kısaca vurgulamakta yarar var. Eloy Rodriguez'in konuşmasında Medoinet e, açık yerişim ilkelerinden bahsetti. Biliyorsunuz bu bütün üniversitelere de gönderilmişti. Bu hem... E, 
kurumsal arşivler hem de fonlayıcılar açısından açık erişim politikası örnekleri içeriyordu. Fakat daha sonra biz özellikle bu yıl içerisinde yüksek öğretim açık arşiv projesinin yapıldığını düşünerek gene üniversitelere örnek üniversitesi açık erişim politikası diye bir doküman hazırlayarak göndermiştik. Sayın Rodriguez'in sözünü ettiği bu zorunlu olması, hemen kabul edilir edilmez arşivde depolanması ve değerlendirme için kullanılması gibi unsurlar da bu örnek üniversitesi açık erişim modelinde vardı. Belki de bundan sonraki şeylerde, uygulamalarda bunların göz önüne alınmasında yarar var diye düşünüyoruz. Zamanımızı da düşünerek e, her iki konuşmacı için sadece birer e, soru alabileceğiz. E, lütfen sorularınız kısa olursa e, iyi olur. Biliyorum aranızda şu anda yemeği e, e, belki de tercih edecekler var. Onun için birazcık e, sabrınızı zorlayacağız. Kusura bakmayın. Sorusu olan var mı? Orhan Bey ilk elini kaldırdı. Buyursun. Kime soruyorsunuz onu da söyleyebilirsiniz. Evet, Sayın Rodriguez'e sorusunu yöneltecek. Teşekkür ederim. Öncelikle güzel açıklama. Süleyman Demirel Üniversitesi Sparta'dan katılıyorum. Orhan Alav. Şimdi Türkiye'de bizde de yeni yeni açık erişim politikaları, tabii uzun süredir çok takdire dahil çalışmalar var ama belirli politikaların, standart politikaların oluşturmasına çalışılıyor. Siz bu politikaları Portekiz'de belirlerken, Niye göre e, belirlediniz bu standartları? Bir ekip çalışması mı sadece Minio Üniversitesi olarak mı yoksa Portekiz Devleti'nin belli bir e, açık erişim politikası e, söz konusu miydi? E, söz konusu var mıydı? Teşekkür ediyorum. It's it's working yes. Uh, I think it's always very important when when we have a, a problem we always uh, should look at uh, on the way that others address the problem, even if we want to do differently. But uh, in the case of Minho, when we started, we, we, we were aware of the key UT policy that uh, Alma mentioned, and, from, and also from Southampton. So you, you use those policies initially as model. Then we, uh, we started to learn from our own experience, and, uh, and we started to, to use our experience to, to uh, create new, uh, new documents. So the documents that I mentioned, so the Portuguese uh, Open Access uh, Policy Kit that we elaborated in 2010, and uh, the Medwanet guidelines that uh, are also in Turkish and that uh, Yashar uh, uh, mentioned again, I think they are very uh, useful tools to, you, you find there uh, uh, very useful information and also even models Uh, that you can use to, to create an effective policy according to the criteria that I, that I mentioned here. Yeah, uh, if you could add a few. Uh, um, um, Alma uh, bana hatırlattı. Medoinet projesinin devamı olarak da şu anda uh, bir Avrupa Birliği destekli proje yürütülüyor. Pasteur uh, projesi. Bu projesinin temel amacı da Avrupa Birliği ülkelerindeki açık erişim politikalarının Avrupa Birliği mevzuatıyla uyumlu hale getirilmesine yönelik. Proje bu yılın başında başladı. Sayın Alma Sıvan projede bir partner olarak yer alıyor. Dolayısıyla sanıyorum ki açık erişim politikalarının Burada örneğini gördüğümüz Minho Üniversitesi benzeri olması için ya da Horizon 2020'de olduğu gibi zorunlu hale getirilmesi giderek bütün ülkeler açısından da bir zorunluluk haline geliyor. Onun için de Türkiye olarak bizim de bir an önce belki de bu tür politikalar geliştirmek için çaba sarf etmemiz gerekiyor. Son bir soru eğer Sayın Doktor Sıvan'a sorunuz varsa onu da alalım ve oturumu kapatalım. Evet. Ben şunu merak ettim. Çok teşekkür ederim öncelikle sunumlar için. E, Alma Sıvan konuşmasında özellikle fon sağlayıcıların açık veriyi çok desteklediğini söyledi. Bunun için bağımsız bir politika mı güdürüyor yoksa zaten genel olarak hani fon sağlayıcılar açık erişimi destekliyor. Bunun bir parçası olarak açık veri mi var onu merak ettim. 
Teşekkür ederim. This has come from the funders themselves. We saw very little activity from funders early, but then suddenly, a few years ago, funders started to accept the argument for open access. And we had some early moves. Um, in fact, in the UK, we have seven research councils. And they all had a policy in place between 2005 and 2007. They actually, in 2012, made a new one, all of them together, all seven. Uh, but so we were, talk we're talking about quite a lot of years ago when funders started to do that. Um, but over the last three to four years, we've seen lots of funders acting independently. They're not taking their guidance from anywhere except from their national governments. Certainly in the UK, our national government had a very strong open agenda and drove the research councils to, to change their policy and make it stronger. Um, and in some cases that has happened. But in others, it's come from within the funders themselves because they understand the arguments, they understand that publicly funded research should be available to the public that funded it. And that is, that, that is the, the single most influential argument, piece of uh, argument that we've ever been successful in making. If the public, all of us, are going to pay taxes to fund research, then the findings and the knowledge created from that should be available to the public. And the funders are the ones who have that money and spend it. And so it is their responsibility to ensure that openness comes. And they are doing that themselves. So yes, it's been very successful. And once a few do it, then the others start to take notice. So that's what we're seeing now, which is very good. Thank you. Uh çok teşekkür ediyorum. Ben her iki e, konuşmacımıza da e, gerek e, açık erişimin karşı karşıya kaldığı e, meydan okumaları, gerekse başarılı e, açık erişim politikalarının nasıl olması gerektiği ile ilgili bize çok değerli e, deneyimlerini aktardıkları için çok teşekkür ediyoruz. Sizlere de sabrınız için teşekkür ediyoruz. Öğleden sonraki oturumlarla ilgili olarak herhalde e, bir şey söylenecektir. Ben onu sayın organizatörlere bırakıyorum ve teşekkür ediyorum.